We're going to start. My name is Jim Gilkinson. I'm a member of the reunion committee. And before I introduce the speaker, I have an announcement. Some of you have been, all the sessions this afternoon are being recorded. And I was asked, how are you going to see them? They are going to send you an email with the link so that you can see all of the sessions. OK. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Paul Dauenhauer. Paul is the DuPont Young Professor and Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science at the University of Minnesota. He serves as the co-director of the Catalysis Center for Energy Innovation. He received his BS in Chemical Engineering and Chemistry from the University of Wisconsin at Madison and PhD in Chemical Engineering from the University of Minnesota. He worked for the Dow Chemical Company as a senior research engineer in Midland, Michigan and Freeport, Texas. His work on catalysis and reaction engineering of renewable feedstocks has been highlighted by numerous awards, including the Department of Energy Early Career and NSF Career, the Rutherford Eris Excellence in Reaction Engineering Award, and the Camille Dreyfus Teacher Scholar Award. He is the co-founder of Ceronics Renewables and inventor of the flagship technology for Activated Research Company. Please help me welcome Paul Dauenhauer. I don't, so I think this, this mic is on. Can you guys hear me okay? No. No. Okay. <laughs> How about that? Is that better? Okay, I'm a chemical engineer, not electrical. How about that? Is that too loud? Is that a little better? Right about there? Okay, we can change it during the talk. I'm also a loud speaker, so. If I get carried away, just interrupt me during the talk if you can't hear me. I might be a little too live too. Okay, so biomass. Uh, let me let me go back, review this a little bit. I am a chemical engineer. I got my PhD here at the University of Minnesota. Then I went out and did some other things, and then I came back. So my interest is obviously chemical engineering. I co-direct this D Department of Energy Research Center that's focused on renewable chemicals and fuels. And out of all this research, we have three startup companies we work on, which I'm going to go over kind of the technology, what these companies consist of, and, and, and what the impact is. So let me go some background. I know some of you are chemical engineers and some are not. But uh, regardless, there, there's a lot of history. And I'm sure you know a lot, uh, lot to do with petroleum, chemicals, and energy is very much interactive with society and social policy and history. Actually, the history of chemical engineering, energy, and society is very much intertwined. And I, I like to show the undergrads this figure. This is a present, or, um, a set of data I've taken from the uh, International Energy Agency, where I'm plotting the production of petroleum uh, per every year as a function of the time. And if you look at this, the red data here is actually conventional United States oil production, uh, which peaked actually in 1972, and then went right back, started to go right back down. This is conventional oil production. If you take worldwide production, you can see in green right here, it went up, and you can see in blue is the predicted uh, future production rates uh, throughout the world predicted by the IEA. Um, what's interesting, though, when I, when I point this out to students, is if you, if you overlay just a little bit of history with this, right? Uh, so here's the, the blip for the 70s oil crisis, right? It almost doesn't even show up. It's so hard to see. It's so, I mean, I'm sure the people that lived through it thought it, thought it was significant, <laughs> right? It doesn't show up in the data that well. Here's World War II. Here's World War I. And now we're back to the Civil War. The first major oil discovery was in, right during the Civil War period in, the, uh, in Pennsylvania. And you go back just a little bit earlier, uh, Napoleon right here, obviously, with horses. So uh, I tell my students that petroleum used to be history, depending on when you look at it. And from this vantage point, uh, you can start to see how that's going to have to be true. If I take each of these curves, these are conventional Hubbard production curves. Now, if they're going to follow this or not, obviously nobody knows. If I knew that, I would be an investor, right? <laughs> um, but we know that the do follow these Hubbard production curves. So uh, we can start to think about what the future would look like depending on the area under each curve. So if I integrate any of these curves, I can get the total supply of conventional oil production. Uh, so what's amazing about this type of analysis, though, just playing with the numbers, is if you take it and you actually double the production, you only move the peak about one generation. So the difference between 3.3 and 6.6 trillion barrels of oil, only one generation in peak production, right? which is just a, a very short period of time. Uh, 
Now that has important implications. It means that even if uh, significantly in our estimates of total oil uh, uh, supply, it's, it's not going to have too big of an impact on when we may need to make a dramatic transition in human history. So uh, what comes from petroleum and what do we need to do about this? Well, I'm, I know a lot of you know this already, a huge fraction of it is gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. And then the rest are our small products here and there, asphaltines for roads, uh, but also other products like chemicals here are a big part of the, the products that we see. Now what's changed, even since I was a graduate student here at University of Minnesota, is the energy world has kind of been turned upside down almost secretly and, and behind the scenes. The, the only way the public knows is the technology of, of fracking or hydraulic fracturing. And what happened about the time I became a professor around 2008 was we went from uh, natural gas being uh, in short supply to now it being a dominant energy source uh, of non-conventional resources. That's also affected the oil supply and it's driven the oil price down about $30 per barrel and completely changed the economics of what's happening here in the United States. We are now a propane exporter to Europe. Uh, when we were at just before that point, we were talking about taking liquefied natural gas into this country. So it's, it's completely changed everything around. It's, it's improved uh, so many things for the United States. It's put us in such a much better manufacturing uh, 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 position. The big challenge, though, is that these are, a lot of these are really good resources because they're very hydrogen rich. They're domestic. They, they're actually, a lot of them are located night, close to resources. We're close to North Dakota. Pennsylvania is close to the East Coast. The Texas supplies are close to Houston. The biggest challenge, though, is the environmental issue. And this is the one that, that is very hard to define. If you take, and this is the one we could, you know, there are experts on way beyond what I am, but we know that when any of the major oil companies do a major project, they include an oil, a carbon price, just in anticipation of the potential for a new policy 20 or 30 years out because their investments are multiple decades. So the question is, what's that carbon price gonna be? And a lot of people will say, well, let's, let's take the uh, impact of climate change and then we'll add up the costs of that and then we'll divide that by all the gallons of gasoline and diesel and petroleum that are, that are consumed and that'll be our carbon price. And the, the question I always put to my students is, if we look ahead at the impacts, this is five, mil five meters of sea level rise that would put Miami, Jacksonville, New Orleans, would actually put Manhattan and the Statue of Liberty underwater, uh, parts of it at least. So what's, what's the economic impact of something like that? Uh, it might be so high that the, even a carbon tax might, might help us transition to alternative feedstocks, um, but, but we're gonna have to find alternatives. So the, the US Department of Energy is working on this very aggressively and they have huge programs in batteries, solar, wind, nuclear, and even bioenergy that they're working on very aggressively. So the one I work on, <clears throat> and there's many people here in the university, I'm sure that you know, work on these different areas, but the one I work on is biomass. <clears throat> For several reasons, it's again, it's a domestic resource that the United States has a lot of, but it completes the energy cycle. So CO2 in the atmosphere is captured by plants, by photosynthesis. We convert this into some sort of pellet or fuel, which converts back to CO2 and then goes around in a circle. So come, Conceptually, the idea being that we can cap, we only emit as much CO2 as we capture and we close the loop. Uh, now, that's the concept. Can we actually achieve that type of behavior and the carbon impact that we'd like at economically viable prices? That's a huge question. Is this mic working okay? Okay. Cuts in and out. Would it be better if I just took it off? All right. How about, is that, is that gonna be better? Yeah. Okay, I'll try not to move so much. Okay, so uh, the question is how to, how to achieve something like that. And it has to do with uh, the type of biomass we work with. So the, the first uh, stage of biomass production has overwhelmingly been of these three classes, the carbohydrates and the oils. So um, people in Minnesota don't need to be told this, but we make a lot of maize. We can take out of that the starch, convert that to sugars, and then take that to ethanol and other products. The alternative is to take natural oils, such as soybean oil, to fatty acid methyl esters, and then that will be biodiesel. These are, have, and I get this question every time I present, is what's the impact on food costs and the food versus fuel debate? 
The Department of Energy is very aware of this, and they're pushing very hard for what they call lignocellulosic biomass production. And so if you look over here on the left, this are grasses, trees, agricultural waste, non-food things for, for humans. And the other good benefit is that the places where you would grow lignocellulosic biomass are not necessarily the places you would grow uh, soybeans or corn. They require different types of locations. So uh, they're not really going to compete with each other. Now that's a huge question as to what the potential is. So in about 2005, the U.S. Department of Energy put out a study, and everybody knows this as the billion ton study. I can never remember the full long you know, government name, but everybody just calls it the billion ton study. If you Google this, you'll, you'll find it. It's got really nice figures. But what the U.S. Department of Energy did was they said, um, if we take the United States and we project out to 2050, what is the most amount of biomass that's lignocellulosic in nature, the non-food biomass we could produce without competing for food? And they looked at several different scenarios. And the conclusion they came to is by 2050, we could produce about 1.3 billion tons of dry biomass from lignocellulosic materials that doesn't compete with food. And that number is sufficiently high that it could displace all chemicals, all aviation fuel, and a fraction of gasoline and diesel, but not everything. So the answer has always been, it's not a silver bullet that can replace all carbon that we get from petroleum or natural gas, but in combination with solar, wind, battery-powered cars, all together, we could account for all energy technologies related to transportation and materials. So how do we do this? There, again, this is another area besides climate change that, that is integrated with energy, but we could talk about it for a very long time. The question for the chemical engineers is how do we take these materials and convert them to things that have value? So if you look at lignocellulosic biomass, it's, it's very difficult to work with because it's, first of all, it's a solid, and we like liquids and gases. Uh, and on top of that, it's a composite material. We, a huge fraction of it is this material cellulose, which is a straight chain of beta glycosidic bonds. So it's a straight chain of glucose units. Hemicellulose is five carbon sugars that can be branched, many different types. But between these two, it makes up almost two thirds of biomass. About a quarter of it is lignin that you see here in red. Depending on the biomass you work with, it can have these molecules called extractives in varying amounts. There are things that you can actually smell that give the, the, the plants its, its unique characteristics. And depending on if you work with wood or grasses, this ash content can vary from less than a percent to up, even up to 10% for some grasses. It can be very large. Not only is it made of all these polymers, but these polymers are integrated together. It the, gives the plant a structure. So the, what's unique about wood is that it's, it takes these carbohydrate polymers and it creates these long rods that you see right here. These are semi-crystalline, and those give wood its ability uh, to resist compaction. And those long rods are called microfibrils, are connected together by these lignin structures, which allow the fibrils to kind of bend. And this is what gives wood its unique properties. And it's why it's used for so many things, such as floors, ships, bikes, banjos, all sorts of different things. But what it's done over time is wood is, and lignocellulosic material has been developed to actually resist biological breakdown. So it, it, evolution is selected for material structures that are actually purposely hard to degrade to useful chemicals. And so we're gonna, I guess we're going to fight nature. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, there's, there's two whole families of approaches. There's the ones you probably know about, which are biological. If you know an ethanol plant, they take yeast and they degrade starch. And so that's a really nice feedstock because it's easy to get to. It's non-crystalline. You can attack all of the bonds nicely. And on top of that, the yeast has already been uh, evolved to produce the ethanol products that you want. The problem is that lignocellulose doesn't work well with enzymes because that's how it has evolved. So the thermochemical side is another entire different approach to, to converting biomass. And this is essentially by conversion by traditional methods that you'd see in an oil refinery. These now break down into three subcategories. Uh, the low temperature is what we call the monomers or sugars approach. You take low temperature, usually in water or, or, or similar oxygenated solvents, and you can produce monomers like glucose, mannose, xylose, fructose, and then you can take those monomers and either ferment them or reform them or convert them by, by some sort of catalytic chemistry to different products or fuels down here. And I'm going to show you a lot about this area over here on the right. Another area, which I'll talk about at the end, is to take biomass and heat it up to 300 to 500 degrees C. 
500 degrees C is just at the point where it gets hot enough to almost start to give a kind of yellow-orange look to it um, the, when, you, when you radiate heat. And this makes a product called pyrolysis oils or bio-oils, which can then be upgraded to things like alcohols, alkanes, transportation fuel. The more traditional approach is called gasification. In this case, it's much higher temperatures, up almost to combustion, and we add a little bit of oxygen, and we convert this to one carbon gas is called synthesis gas, then this can go through a synthetic process to make methanol or liquids. If you know, you know your history, you know that in World War II, and actually also in South Africa, this synthetic approach has been used by the Germans. They took coal and they converted coal into synthesis gas and then used fischer tropsch chemistry to make hydrocarbons when they didn't have access to petroleum. What we're proposing in this stage here, I'm not gonna talk about this today, is to do the same thing with mass. So I'll start over here on the right. I'll show you two examples we're working on that I'll end up over here on the left. So what should we make in terms of chemicals from biomass? It's actually not obvious. And what's happened is around the world, uh, research labs have basically tried to make everything. And what I always argue with people is there are some chemicals that make sense and some that don't make sense. So if you think about, if you look at the plot on the left, you can think of the size of a molecule based on how many carbons are in it. And you can think of the oxidation state. Now, uh, something like uh, CO2 is heavily oxidized, so it's high up down here. And something like alkanes might be way down here, very reduced. Glucose and xylose, the, the sugars that are in biomass, sit right here in the middle. And the things we'd like to make, we don't want to have to go very different in molecule size. So we don't want to go left or right. So we don't want to go to diesel, necessarily. We don't want to go to syngas products, and we don't want to go up or down, which is the oxidation state. So something like aromatics or BTX make a lot of sense. The other question we have is, is what impact can we make? And so there's a really nice report put out by the IEA looking at the energy consumption that's used to manufacture chemicals related to the production amount. And you can see there's a bunch of chemicals that are very large in size, ammonia, ethylene, propylene, polyethylene, and methanol. And another set of chemicals are something like BTX, uh, benzene, toluene, xylene. And related to that is terephthalic acid. That's the chemical that's used in, in bottles and polyesters. So here are three projects that we worked on based on this way of thinking about what to make. It, we start with molecules like glucose. This is the major component of biomass. And then we target molecules that are about the same size. And it turns out when you remove an oxygen, you'll get a double bond without paying too much of an energetic penalty. So these molecules make a lot of sense. Glucose to paraxylene is a, is a very good choice for that exact reason. And on top of that, once we oxidize this, we can make the, the polymer that's in Coke bottles. So you've probably seen the plant bottle logo. If you read the fine print, they only have one of the two chemicals to make it entirely renewable bottle because they're missing this one right here. And we've actually received funding from them, Coca-Cola, to work on this molecule. This research has gone on for five years, and we're now at 97% yield of this molecule. So extremely efficient process, and we have intellectual property at the University of Minnesota here for that. I'm not going to talk about this one today, but I'll talk about the two new ones. There's a molecule called isoprene. It's a five-carbon molecule. It's the key compound used in car tires. And this molecule over here, if uh, I'm sure everybody's washed clothing, you'll know it as a soap molecule or a surfactant. It's called linear alkyl benzene sulfonate. It's the key component in products such as Tide. Now what's important right away is to look at the economics. If, obviously, if sugars are expensive and these products are cheap, then you have no hope of ever being economical. So you, if you're going to use this soap molecule, then you need to add in molecules like this. These are called chelating agents. So what we've invented is a new surf surfactant soap molecule that can operate in hard water without the need for these chelating agents. You don't want to have to add these in. They add extra cost, and they just go right down to the drain and into the rivers and streams. So that's good because we can eliminate half the chemicals in your cleaning products. So the question is, how does that work, and how do you possibly make something like that? And what we're going to show you is we can make these in a completely new way from biomass <clears throat> using furans from sugar, hydrophobic molecules from fatty acids, and then we can tune this exactly for the performance that we're looking for. So how do we do that? Well, it takes a couple of PhD students working for a couple years, <laughs> and this is a summary of their theses, okay? <laughs> so this is the furan molecule from sugar, 
here's the fatty acid from soybean oil. And we take it through all these different steps. And don't worry about what they are, but basically if we do the right conditions, it, it works well. If we do the wrong conditions, it doesn't work at all. So, um, but we can make three different classes of surfactants. You can see they all have this furan structure. They all have these R groups. This is the oleo groups. So we call these oleofuran sulfonates. And we can change the amount of branching and the size. We can add this, this oxygen here, or we can just make them straight. Now when we do that, we not only have to synthesize and purify all these, but I also need my students to figure out which of these are any good. So what we use are these performance metrics for soap. Now, a key metric is what's called the critical micelle concentration. There's a very simple way to think about this, which is if you add enough of it, eventually they'll go from forming these single molecules to these micelles, and these are what capture oils and dirt in your clothing and remove it into the water. So you want as low of a CMC as possible to be able to use as little soap as possible. Okay, the other one is this craft point. This is the temperature where the soap will actually start to form crystals that you see like this. This is, this, if you've ever washed in really cold water and you see the surfactant kind of turn gooey, right, that's the problem, it, it's, the craft point is too high. So if I change all the different structures of the soap molecules, I can actually sweep out an area starting way up here, through here, and down over here, and actually way out to the right. And it turns out the molecule we want to mimic in Tide and other cleaning products is right here. And we can make several different molecules that all fall within this space. So several of these can hit the detergent market performance specs. But what's really neat is if I take our molecule and compare it to linear alkyl benzene sulfonate in conventional detergents, I see something really unique. Um, if I take the conventional molecule and I start to add calcium like you'd have naturally in your water at home, once I get to about 200, it starts to turn cloudy. And when I get up to 10,000, it starts to get really cloudy because the, 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 the crystals are extremely large. This is about where seawater is, or a little bit higher than that. If I take our molecule, no matter how much calcium or magnesium I add, it stays crystal clear. And you can see that down here on the right. So if you look at the turbid concentration, the point where it turns unclear versus the micelle stability range, Conventional surfactants are down here, and this is where all of America sits in water hardness. And we're making surfactants that work way up here, okay, orders of magnitude away. So my student that graduated last year saw this technology. We had uh, patents on the technology, and he said, I want to take this and I want to commercialize it. I said, I have no idea how that works. Go for it, right? He worked with the University Office of Technology Commercialization, and now he's raised enough money to take this off the ground and he's giving samples to many companies that you know, you've heard about that make soaps and cleaners. Um, so there are companies called Ceronics Renewables. The neat thing about this is because we can tune it, we've been targeting the detergents market, but we could also go to agrochemicals, cosmetics, paints and coatings, or oil recovery. Okay, another technology we have is to make monomers for renewable rubber. Rubber is kind of like petroleum in that there's a really long history of uh, re relating uh, society and war uh, back to its production. If you know back from World War II, uh, rubber was a big problem because it came from Southeast Asia. And so there was a big push to make all synthetic rubber. And to do that, you need to make these molecules, isoprene and butadiene. Isoprene can be polymerized into polycis isoprene. That's the key component in car tires. Butadiene shows up everywhere. It can be polybutadiene, ABS plastic, like hard pipes, Nitrile butadiene rubber, like soft gloves, and uh, styrene butadiene, which is another abrasive resistant material in car tires. So it shows up all over the place. And actually, this story is, for us is quite young. We started uh, last summer. Again, we start over here on the left with things like glucose and xylose, and we want to get to the molecules over on the far right. So another professor and I have worked out a technology where we can take these feedstocks and go to these intermediates that look like this, these ring molecules with very high selectivity. That's actually pretty easy to do. The big breakthrough came when three professors and I were working together. And we discovered that we could actually break open this ring to make these straight molecules and remove the oxygen in a single step. That turned out to be extremely selective. And we did that using this breakthrough new material. This SPP was invented. It's a special catalyst invented by Michael Sapatsis here at the University of Minnesota. And last summer, we discovered that if we add in phosphorus in a unique way, it makes this amazing new solid acid catalyst. So it's 99% selective here, it's 70% selective here, and you can make pentadiene and hexadiene also. So we work out 
the chemistry of this, and I'll show you kind of how we do this, we can start with these molecules. This is actually one of the intermediates. We can calculate the energy to go from step to step. So we decided based on the thermodynamics to break this into two reactions from here to here. You can see that ring again. And then I take this out of the liquid and into the gas phase where I do this ring opening dehydration in a single step. So doing this, we've come up with ways to screen lots of different catalytic materials. So I, these are all, if you've heard of any of these, some of these are very old solid acid materials. This is actually the key one that's used to make your gasoline right now. And if I look at this reaction to ring open it and remove the oxygen, I can look at the conversion of that reaction. And then it's selectivity, which tells me what fraction of the converted material went to the molecule I want. So it turns out if, you, if I look just broadly, the majority of the, of the catalysts that we look at are actually very poor performers. They make very little isoprene. But if I look at this new class of materials, this phosphorus materials, I can actually make 90% selectivity, still at 20% conversion to these open uh, straight chain and branched alkenes with 70% being isoprene. Right? That was pretty amazing. I remember the day we discovered that. Then when we took this further, we looked at this variation, it was 97 to 99% selective. So based on this, we've, we've developed methods to screen lots of different conditions with this special catalyst. And we came up with a high throughput method just in the other building over here where we could look at 50 different experiments in a single day. So this composite map you're seeing here is where I change the temperature of the reaction and I change the time that the molecules spend in the reactor by, by a factor of 100. And doing that, I can then plot how much of this isoprene I make. There's some areas where I make very little some areas where I make a lot. There's clearly an optimum right about there. And I can actually see the spaces where I make the other molecules. This starts to go down from here to here because I start to make more of these C4 and C3 molecules rather than the, the five carbon molecules. So this is just gives you an idea of kind of the experiments that we do and how we evaluate these types of technologies. So we have a whole intellectual property portfolio uh, that we work on. I told you earlier about the, the polyethylene uh, terephthalate PET plastics. We work on isoprene and butadienes for rubber, but we also make a new product called uh, uh, rubbery polyesters. That's made from branched dials that you see right here. The surfactants technology is going to this startup company, but then we also have another side of the lab that works on renewable fuels. So uh, this kind of ends the chemicals part and starts going into more of the fuel space. Now the question about energy is how do we convert biomass to make biofuels in a way that makes sense? And it turns out that it, not only do we have to change the chemistry dramatically, but we have to change the way we think about how we make fuels. If you think about the classic petroleum process facility, it's extremely efficient, both energy and materials wise. And that has to do with the fact that I have the ability to move petroleum and natural gas very efficiently around the country which means I can get my economy of scale in very large, very efficient processes all in one location. So I have all my sources that all converge on one point. The problem with biomass, and this is a huge systems research area, is that I can't move biomass really more than 50 miles without becoming too expensive, which means I can't get it down to the Gulf Coast or to New Jersey or Louisiana. I have to process it in Minnesota. So you have to think of these uh, distributed models of processing right, throughout the, the state. And, Pedromo Staltides in our department works on this way of thinking of where you would place biorefineries, what scale makes the most economic sense. The question is, that, is what makes the most sense for what type of technology? We know about the scale that works for ethanol plants, and it's not full refinery scale. Now, a new technology that's, that's been worked on uh, a lot by me in the last 15 years is a uh, technology some people call it biopolymer cracking, some people call it pyrolysis, and that's essentially break apart by fire. Um, what this, the way this works is we start with a material of biomass such as grasses or woods and we heat this up very quickly to 500 C. Now when we do that, these long polymer chains like cellulose will break apart. And if I let that break apart for a long time, it would break all the way down to carbon monoxide. That's the syngas approach. However, if I quench it really quick after about a one second of reaction, I don't make gases, I make vapors. And if I condense that, I get this brown liquid. This is called bio oil or pyrolysis oil. And it's conceptually similar to uh, oil, but it's got a lot more oxygen and functionality. And so I can then take this and upgrade it to fuels, chemicals, and consumer products. Right now, the US Department of Energy 
uh, EERE program is working heavily on this in Colorado at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. They have a full-scale system that looks very much like this reactor right here. And the way this works is I take something like a biomass fiber and I inject it into this riser reactor. The gases come in and are very hot in inert. They flow the particle up and by the time it gets from the bottom to the top, it's fully degraded into vapors and some of the uh, inorganic material. Those then come out, go into this cyclone, the vapors come out the top and are condensed, and then any solid that's left comes back in here and is mixed with oxygen and generates the heat. The question is, if I only have one to two seconds from the bottom to the top, what's happening in that period of time and how do I tune it? If anybody's worked in the petroleum industry, they know that there's really sour petroleum, but then there's also what's called sweet crude. And we'd like to make the equivalent of sweet crude from uh, biomass and not the sulfur-rich sour uh, material. So how to evaluate that is a huge challenge because the molecules are really ugly. Right? They have lots of oxygen, lots of functionality. They're really unstable and hard to work with. If I just take a fraction of that, I can inject that into what's called a gas chromatograph. And when I separate this out, each one of these separate peaks here is a separate compound. And you can see if I zoom in on just this little part, all the number of compounds that are in that mixture are extremely difficult to determine and quantify. It's a huge analytical challenge. So we're reaction people, but what we've also become is analytical chemists on the side. So the problem is every time I get one of these peaks, I have to know what the area of that peak is and then relate that back to some composition, which means I have to calibrate every single one of these peaks to know what the composition of that material is. And if it's five compounds, that's easy. If it's 500, it's almost impossible. So I was having coffee with a student about four years ago, and we were discussing how this was almost an intractable problem. And we came up right there sitting coffee with some paper about an idea, which was if this is a gas chromatograph where I created that chromatogram on the previous slide, and in that I would inject a sample of liquid, it would then separate in this column. The molecules, once they're separated, come out of the column one by one. That's how I get each of the separate peaks. And then it would go to a detector, it's called the flame ionization detector, where I would see each one. And the idea was each molecule was responding differently in the flame, but if I put in a reactor that converts each molecule to the same molecule before it goes into the detector, mm -hmm. then they respond the same way. So it's conceptually very simple. If I turn every molecule coming out of here into methane, then I know the response every time without calibrating. So we came up with this idea for a small microreactor it's, this is actually about the size of your thumb. That's a penny right there. And it's a 3D printed metal microreactor. So you put in the design into a computer and it, t it actually prints it out uh, with metal with flow chambers and heating chambers inside of it. You can see the weld points here and here. And then I take that and I put it into the GC. This is how, actually how it fits in right there. Now when I do that, I can compare the method I do with what's conventionally done and you can see on this parity plot, if I use my method, which is called quantitative carbon detection versus conventional FID, I get the same answer. The difference is I don't have to calibrate. I don't even have to know what the molecules are. So, and on top of that, because I use this 3D printed metal microreactor, I get exquisite um, uh, chromatograms. There's no loss in resolution. They still look, between the blue and the black, that's with and without the microreactor, they look essentially the same. So now I can work with really big systems and the analysis is really easy. So this idea we thought would be very useful in the lab, it turns out I met a, a friend of mine, um, this guy, who's also a gopher, and I showed this to him and he said, oh man, that sounds really valuable. And I said, oh maybe. And he said, no, it really is. So he started this company out in Eden Prairie, activated research company, and they now sell these around the world. Um, they've sold them overseas to Fortune 500 companies and Places like Caltech and MIT have these systems now. Okay, so that solves one of the two challenges. We can now analyze these oils very nicely, but that we still don't know what the chemistry is. If we go back to the polymer, we can have these long chains of carbohydrates. This is a glucose molecule right here, but these can be thousands of units long. The, the question is, when this breaks apart to the products, how does it do it? How does it pick that molecule over that molecule over that molecule? multiplied by 500. That's a really hard problem because I would like to do is tune it. I'd like to make a lot of this and very little of that. That's a problem molecule right there. So we had a, a lot of discoveries in this area. If I take a particle of cellulose, this is a particle of microcrystalline cellulose. This is actually what they use to pack pills 
uh, come to give it volume and something that you can ingest. Um, <clears throat> but if I take this and I put it on a hot surface, this is about 600 degrees C. We made a discovery in 2009 that turns out to change completely the way we think about this chemistry. Each one of these frames has a listing in milliseconds, so this reaction happens in about a tenth of a second. This particle is only a third of a millimeter wide. Once it reacts, after about a hundred or a tenth of a second, it actually starts to liquefy. And you can see after about uh, 148 thousandths of a second, it's fully liquid droplet and then it evaporates. And so if you take this particle and drop it on a hot surface, it looks like it just disappears. It's that quick. It's really hard to see. The big discovery, though, is that it's a solid, then it's a liquid, and then it's a vapor. Now, it turns out to have really big implications for the chemistry. So what we're trying to do here is we have the solid to liquid to, you can actually see the vapors coming off transition, and we're making just hundreds of compounds over the course of a fraction of a second. That's the challenge. That's overwhelming. So I had a really good graduate student who said, I think we, I know how we can do this. And he spent five years and about $800,000 of Department of Energy money. And we built this reactor right here. This is about the size of an orange. And what I can do with this is I can take a solid material. I can take it from room temperature up to 400 to 600 degrees C in about a tenth of a, um, 10 thousandths of a second. I can then hold the temperature and then quench it really fast. And when I do that, I now control how long the solid reacts. So when I do that, every time I pick the reaction time, it might only react for 20 thousandths of a second at high temperature, but then I can take all the vapors that come off and figure out what those are. So every time I do that, the experiment, I hit a button, by the time my finger's off the keyboard, the experiment's done. Okay? But then it takes almost two hours to analyze what all those different compounds are. So the student basically runs an experiment, and then he goes, I don't know, reads the internet for two hours, comes back and does another experiment, another experiment, and by the end of the day, you can put together all of these different chromatograms, and you can take off for a single component, you can actually see the growth of that single compound with millisecond resolution. That's the first time it's ever been done, and we just published it last year. So uh, there's a lot we learned from this, but let me show you something really neat. If I take the evolution of compounds, with time, I can do that as a function of the temperature. So here's the temperature presented in kind of a unique way. Uh, but what you see, there's a nice kink in the data right about there. And that's a, it turns out to have very important implications. There's two entirely different sets of chemistry that change right at that point. It's 467 degrees C. And what's happening is, this will work here in a minute, is if you go through a really important transition, and you have these really long chains of polymers, the one on the top happens below 467C. And what's happening is it's only reacting from the end of the chain and downward. So if you have 1,000 or 10,000 monomers long, it takes a really long time to degrade all the way to the end. When you get above 467C, you now have enough energy that the polymer can break apart anywhere in the middle. Now this is really important because when it breaks apart in the middle, it quickly falls apart and makes vapors. When it can only react at the end, it doesn't like to make vapors because most of the polymer will dehydrate. You know this if you've worked with, you know, anybody who's worked in a wood fire knows that low temperature, it just turns black, right? You get some smell, but mostly a lot of black. This is the exact reason for that. You're getting a lot of this chemistry up here and you're making uh, coals and solid residue. When you get hot enough, this is why when people rub sticks together, they have to get to a certain temperature to really make a lot of vapors. You're breaking into this point where you start to break up the polymer. So we've used this insight to come up with a new reactor technology where we can take particles and contact them with a surface right above that temperature. It gives you a lot of vapors and it's extremely efficient. And this is now being taken by a local company in Verde and being uh, developed. So let me just kind of give a quick summary here. We, we get funding from the National Science Foundation, the US Department of Energy and ExxonMobil, uh, in addition to several other sources that fund this type of work. And out of this, we obviously get PhD theses and papers and all those sorts of things. But the late thing for the University of Minnesota is they really push patents and startup companies. And they, they actually have training sessions for my students. So they'll go over to the Alumni Center and they'll learn what is a patent. How do you start a company? What's a good strategy for starting a company? All the things that I don't actually know much about and can't train them, they're learning about. So these are two University of Minnesota students that recently graduated that have both started companies. Uh, Andrew started ARC. Christoph started Ceronics Renewables, and I, my young students now are also talking to them and thinking about doing this. <clears throat>
Uh, so let me just acknowledge a bunch of people. All these people plus some others did all the work. A lot of this, like I said, was funded by the US Department of Energy. There's a lot going on. I kind of just gave you a quick flavor of what's happening. But let me just say to you, the alumni, thank you for coming today, and I hope this has been interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have nowhere to be for a while, so. So, if you have questions. You described your uh, orange-sized reactor that you've been using in the laboratory. What about uh, commercial scale production? Is that scalable, or do you have to just have a lot of parallel small reactors? So that system we built, if I go back, is only built for re research studies, okay? And from that, we can learn these amazing details about kinetics and mechanisms. The version, of, the big scale version of it is this one right here, where we take all the insight we learned from that and we think about what makes the most sense. So this system is extremely fast because you have the very high heat transfer rates. And because we know how to tune it just to get to that right temperature, uh, it gives you this liquefaction, which creates a lot of vapors. So that, that laboratory scale reactor, you'd never scale that up, but you take that insight to a real system. So we, we have a prototype, and now the company is scaling it up to something that's a little bit bigger, and they're going to go slowly up to the, the full-scale system. Yep. That's why you're in the chemical engineering department. Right, right. So scale-up problems. There's a lot of, I can tell you, I was at a DOE a basic research needs workshop Monday through Wednesday, and there was a person there from Shell talking about the difficulty of taking biomass up in scale because of all the problems with solids handling. It's a big challenge. Yeah, we haven't solved everything in the laboratory, that's for sure. <coughs> How dangerous is this? So it's an oxidation system. So the, the worst thing that can happen is you, you, you get your mix ratio wrong. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's that dangerous compared to many other things in the chemical industry. It's relatively safe. Places that blow up on a regular basis? Refiners? <laughs> <laughs> so you've never had an explosion in my lab, if that's what you mean. So I think, it, I think it's relatively safe. It's, it's a sub-combustion stoichiometry. So it's safer than combustion, I'd say. Plus, it's a solid. It's, unless you get down to, to fine particles, like you'd have in a dust explosion, you, you're not going to have that issue unless there's dust mixed in. So. How about the cost factor? How does it compare with petroleum? One of the things, petroleum is so cheap, it's hard to compete. It'd be different if we put a tax on that so yeah. you make it better level in the field. Yep. So the, the, the question had to do with the economics. And so the, this is something we look at very carefully. Uh, and there are people that make this their entire research area. So I can tell you, for example, the Department of Energy has very specific targets for this type of technology. And their target is $2 per gallon. Okay. Um, whether they're going to hit that, I don't know. But they, 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 they do, I think, make reasonable targets. Now, they use kind of an earlier generation variation of this technology. So I don't know if this improved technology would, would do better at hitting those economic targets. But, but it's something they're looking at closely. Now, that's an entire talk on itself. There's an approach to looking at all these technologies, whether they be chemicals or fuels, called techno-economic analysis, where I take into account everything from the feedstock to the product prices, the processing, the environmental costs, everything associated all together. And you can do uh, optimization and uh, different evaluations, uh, sensitivity analyses to look at all the parameters. But that's looked at for all these different products. Huge infrastructure we have that distributes petroleum <coughs> products. Now, can you distribute this over the same system or do you have to? Sure. Uh, so what, one benefit to this approach is you can make this bio oil very quickly. And the, the hope there is you can stabilize that very quickly. Now, if you can do that, even if you could just go uh, you know, one level larger in scale, your economy of scale gets much better. So that if you can quickly liquefy biomass, then you have the ability to, to commoditize it and trade it and go to large, larger scale biorefineries. It's too early to say what's going to happen with this approach, but, but we're working on it aggressively. There's an H2 uh, byproduct here, I see. What happens to that? Does that so recycle to recover energy? It depends how you do it. So one variation of this is we take the bio oil and we do mild hydro treating. That could stabilize it. In that case, you could either add a little bit of methane or you could reform some of it to make a little hydrogen. It's one of the variations, so I include it in the picture. <laughs>
Um, what is the feedstock for a full scale and uh, what can you do with all that 10% or 9% ash? So, so the, the question is, is what does the feedstock look like and what do we do with the ash? So the feedstock for pyrolysis, they call it feedstock agnostic, which means you can take grasses or trees or egg, egg waste. Now, is that completely true that I was talking to somebody at Shell saying it's not really quite feedstock agnostic because there's some variations in the feed that have to be worked out. But compared to other technologies, it's pretty agnostic. In the end of this, when you, get, when you process it, you do make ash. So in this case, there has to be strategies built into the technology to separate that. So in conventional technology, I don't know if I can find quick, there's a cyclone to remove it. In this technology, we're proposing to separate it right here. So it's something that you'd return back to the soil. So depending on what's needed, different places. It's calcium rich, it's magnesium rich. You'll have some potassium in it. Depending on the feedstock you start with, it'll have a lot of silica. So. <laughs> What, what would be, you say $2 uh, target, what would be a typical sugar-based ethanol uh, comparable price? Uh, that's a good question. I, wouldn't, I, uh, I know who I would ask in the university to get that information, but I, I don't know that offhand. Because I think if you figure, looking at gas prices, what ethanol, pure ethanol would be, it's on the order of a buck fifty or so, and it fluctuates a little bit. Of yeah. No, yeah, there's... It's, I don't know the, quite the answer to that. Yeah, the advantage is most oligosaccharides sources are waste, solid waste. So sometimes you can collect solid waste and charge a fee, a dumping fee for that, yeah. which adds to your profit stream. Right, and so they, what, what he's getting at is basically these feedstocks are extremely cheap or free or uh, you actually get a, a, a revenue. revenue from just taking it off people's hands. So. <coughs> Any other final questions? You guys are probably ready for a break. So, all right, well, thank you. I'll be up here if you have more questions. Sorry about the audio.